Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for February 12th, 2021. And on this episode, I'm talking about the Massachusetts Circular Letter. This was a statement written by Samuel Adams and James Otis Jr., and then passed by the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And then on February 11th, 1768, it was sent to the other colonies in response to the Townsend Acts. Reactions from the British were pretty aggressive. They were not happy with this. They really resulted in higher tensions and then the military occupation of Boston by the British Army, which then contributed to the coming of the American Revolution. I think you're going to find this history to be pretty interesting. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program all the archives, and on individual episodes, I include a bunch of reference links so you can read and learn more on your own time. You can find a bunch of different platforms. We stream live on some mainstream ones. We have some archive-only video versions. We also have the podcast-only edition all over the place. And that way, if you happen to notice that we're missing from your favorite platform, you can either ask us to join in or you can find other places where we either broadcast live or have the archive. That's all over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. You can also find our membership program there where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here, whether it's day one for you or you've been here for every single episode since we started. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. And let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 15 minutes or so. Now, this is actually really just a sequel episode to an episode that I did a couple of weeks ago on John Dickinson's Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania. These were the most widely read collection of documents regarding American liberty up until the publication of Thomas Paine's Common Sense in January of 1776. And here from Rob Nadelson, a quick overview. He said these letters, 12 newspaper op-eds later collected in book form, asserted the colonial cause against imperial British overreach and helped to lay the groundwork for the U.S. Constitution drafted two decades later. The letters also presented important ideas about resisting usurpation. Going further, they were written in response to the British Parliament's Townsend Acts of 1767. They were duties on goods imported to America. They explained, Rob writes, why the Townsend duties were improper or unconstitutional and how and why Americans should resist them. And in his first letter, he's noting some strategy here. He's basically saying, like, look, he's talking about the New York Restraining Act, for example. Like, look, if they can do this to New York, they can do it to anybody. So we can't just sit idly by and let it happen. At very least, we have to get the ball rolling and generate awareness uh, have people understand the principles in opposition to it and then build from there. So he encouraged the other colonies at very least to start by passing non-binding resolutions opposing the Townsend Acts of that year, opposing them, explaining why and urging repeal. And he ended that letter with a phrase that we use here at the TAC as our motto. motto. It's a Latin phrase, concordia res parve criscunt. That means Small things grow great by concord. Now, I covered this whole uh, thing in much more detail in an episode. Like I said, Lessons for Liberty from John Dickinson and the Farmer Letters. It was on February 1st of 2021. I will link to that in the show notes here so you can check out. It's either this is the sequel or maybe that was the prequel to this episode. But uh, they do tie together because it's the same principles and the follow up. What we learned at the end of that episode, and I had learned about this as well, was that Dickinson had only published one of those 12 letters, but he wrote them all in advance. He published one of them in late of 1767. And then on December 5th, he sent the whole batch of them to James Otis Jr. in Boston. He said, like, look, I'm encouraging you to do something with this. You guys led the charge against the Stamp Act, and we need some courage. We need some action. He probably recognized that as Massachusetts went at the time, many others would follow. And so once Otis and Samuel Adams read through them, they started making them more public 
uh, through the Boston Gazette, which was the publishing arm or the mouthpiece, I guess, for the Sons of Liberty. Governor Francis Bernard had actually been holding back on calling the legislature into session that year in late 1767, I think probably in part because there was some opposition and he was getting words that maybe that the House of Representatives were going to oppose the Townsend Acts, but eventually he had to relent. And here from J.L. Bell, he said, but finally, J.L. Bell is one of my favorite historians. This guy does awesome stuff, primarily a lot of stuff on Massachusetts, but really good uh, information. And Bell writes... But finally, with a border dispute with New York to be resolved, which I actually don't know about, so I want to learn about that, the governor reconvened the general court on December 30th, 1767. That was, quote, sooner than I intended, which is what he told his superior in London. But instead, he told earlier than usual, that's what he told the legislators. Bell goes on, he says, instead of taking up the border issue, the House proceeded to consider the state of the province and its charter in relation to divers acts of parliament, which meant the Townsend Act. So they were supposed to deal with this, uh, this border dispute with New York. Instead, they decided to deal with the Townsend Acts. The House formed a committee to address those questions dominated by strong Whigs. Speaker Thomas Cushing, who we'll hear a little bit more about in this story. Clerk Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams was a clerk of the House. Both James Otis's. James Otis and James Otis Jr., Joseph Hawley, John Hancock, Edward Sheaf, Jer Jareth Meal Bowers, and Samuel Dexter. They started off by firing off a bunch of letters opposing the Townsend Acts. For example, uh, they were primarily the work, again, of James Otis Jr. and Samuel Adams. They sent one to their lobbyist in London. I've got a link to that, to Dennis DeBert, agent. This is they called them their agent, but this was their lobbyist in London. The governor didn't like the fact that they even had their own lobbyist for the house. They sent another one to the Earl of Shelburne, uh, who was the secretary of state for North America. They even sent another one to King George III himself. I'm not going to go through any of the details of those letters, but I have them up on the screen. If you want to, it's pretty cool to see them. And I would encourage you to read them at your own time if you'd like to. I will link to those in the show notes. Now back to J.L. Bell. On January 21st, 1768, the House took up yet another proposal from the committee to send a circular letter on those issues to all the other North American legislatures. Remember, Dickinson said, you know, start by passing non-binding resolutions. We want to encourage people to learn about this, to basically plant a flag, say this is bad, and rally people to the cause. And we'll see where it goes from there. Small things grow great by concord. And these are small steps, these non-binding resolutions. JL goes on and says, circular letters were a standard bureaucratic tool of the time. The London government sent them regularly to the royal governors. But legislatures were supposed to communicate upward to those governors and the crown, not independently, and especially not to create a united front against one of Parliament's laws. <laughs> so they didn't necessarily like that this kind of thing was happening. Now, it's hard to know, J.L. writes, exactly what happened when James Otis Jr. and Samuel Adams and the rest of their committee presented the Massachusetts General Court with the first draft of a circular letter to other colonial assemblies. This was on January 21st, 1768. What we do know is that it failed to pass. And then Governor Bernard was all excited about this, immediately wrote to London and said, oh, you know, we won. We thought it was going to be much more difficult, but, uh, you know, they opposed this. They came up with this thing and it's done. But something happened over the next two weeks, and that's how JL puts it as well. Something changed over the next two weeks, but I'm not sure what. The House continued to approve letters protesting the Townsend Act to British government figures. So this was actually kind of frowned upon to even consider doing this. These are basically, it's rebellious almost at that point because you're supposed to go through the process, the agent of the king or the agent of parliament, which was the royal governor, Bernard. Instead, they were just firing these letters off. I mean, very courteous and a lot of bending of the knee when you read through them. But this was really breaking with tradition and with norm. So they sent them to uh, the Marquis of Rockingham on 22nd of January, Earl of Camden on the 29th, the Earl of Chatham on February 2nd. And then on February 4th, 
the House formally reconsidered its former decision. I don't know why, and even JL Bell in another blog post points out that it's just speculation as to what happened. It's possible that the original one had much more aggressive language. We don't know it was actually struck. But according to Cushing, a large majority, in Cushing's words, a large majority of House members voted to revoke the earlier decision. So they, they were able to get enough people to vote to revoke the rejection of the circular letter and even expunge the record of the first vote. So we don't know who voted for or against. It was completely removed. They chose a new committee, drawing largely from the one that had drafted the letters so far, Cushing, Otis, Adams, Hawley, Bowers, Dexter, and now Ezra Richmond. That committee's work was accepted by the House on the morning of February 11th, and Cushing reported that day 83 legislators were present, and the circular letter was, quote, accepted almost unanimously. We really just don't know why they changed their mind. Maybe this is the work of the Sons of Liberty. Maybe this is Samuel Adams or Otis, the firebrand, pushing people in the right direction. Maybe there were modifications. I don't know. But they did send this out to the other colonies. It's a circular letter. And the governor himself sent it to London. You can actually, I will have the link to the full text of this so you can read it. It's not really, really aggressive language, but some interesting parts here that I think uh, apply to us today. For example, here, in all free states, the Constitution is fixed. This is really following up on Dickinson's letters. I think it was number seven, I, off the top of my head, seven or nine, where he was asking, who are a free people? He said, you're not free, Dickinson in his letters said, you're not free just because government doesn't happen to be violating your rights right now, or it's just doing a little bit, or it's just administrated well. You're only free if they're so checked and limited that they can't get away with it. And you can't, actually have that scenario if a constitution, written or unwritten, of course, at the time it was the unwritten British constitution, but if a constitution is flexible, you have to have the expectation of these are the limits of government, and all of a sudden they're going to change things, you are definitely not a free state or a free people. And they're reiterating this, Adams, Samuel Adams, and James Otis Jr. In all free states, the constitution is fixed. And as the Supreme Legislative derives its power and authority from the Constitution, so this is reasserting, or this is asserting a very big change in the viewpoint of sovereignty in the political thought of the American revolutionaries, rather than sovereignty coming from an individual person, that is final authority, or a group of people like Parliament or an oligarchy. Instead, it comes from the Constitution itself, so as the Supreme Legislative derives its power and authority from the Constitution, it cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation. And they go on, they said the Constitution ascertains and limits both sovereignty and allegiance. And here from an article by Andrew Tylock that we published about three years ago, he says, perhaps the most important component letter, part of the letter was that while Adams and Otis believed the adage no taxation without representation. They did not request colonial representation in the British Parliament. They weren't making the case like, oh, we're not properly represented here, so we want representation. No, no, no. They were just rejecting it all out. They instead, he writes, pointed out the impracticality of being taxed by a governing body on the other side of the ocean. And you may be familiar with a, a quote from John Adams some years later. He said, there's something unnatural and odious of about a government with power thousands of leagues off. And that's really the mentality that came out of this from Dickinson's, from Dickinson and again from the Massachusetts Circulator. So we've got Dickinson, Samuel Adams, James Otis Jr. and others. And Andrew goes on, he says, additionally within the letter, Adams and Otis make a more general anti-tax argument. They claim that regardless of whether taxing power is derived from British parliament or local American assemblies, quote, they write that what a man has honestly acquired is absolutely his own, which he may freely give, but cannot be taken from him without his consent. This is like the early version of taxation is theft. More from Andrew Tylock, he says, and Adams and Otis save their most intense criticism for the customs board and the pocket lining nature of the tax collection practices. They claim that the right of the British parliament to tax colonists 
if it were even to exist, it was being abused. They were basically using the taxes to line the pockets of the government officials. And in essence, as Andrew points out, to buy the support of government and customs officials in the colonies. And Andrew is absolutely correct. He says essentially tax collecting bureaucrats and loyal or royal governors were being paid to expand British power in America. And if we're not facing the same type of thing today, uh, it's pretty darn close. Basically that tax system where they tax it from you, they take the money from you, and then they make sure that the people who are playing along are the ones who get that money divvied out to them. We see a very similar relationship between the federal government and the states and the state governors even today. Here from Mike Meharry in an article about this, uh, this whole scenario, he says, the British leadership did not appreciate the colonist defiant attitude. The Earl of Hillsborough, had recently been appointed a new Secretary of State for the Colonies. I think the previous one actually had been out of office by the time they sent the letter over there. So the Earl of Hillsborough was the new Secretary, and he sent the Massachusetts General Court a letter demanding that the body retract the document. So they sent this over, the governor got this, the governor's like, you know, the governor's fully on board with opposing this, but recognizes that the people in Massachusetts were really upset and they didn't like this kind of back and forth garbage. And so Bernard played it kind of cool. It's basically like, look, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the messenger. And this is what the bosses are telling me you have to do. You have to repeal this, get rid of it. And Mike goes on, he says, if the Earl of Hillsborough thought his demands would get the colonists in line and sway the Massachusetts general court to renounce the circular letter, he was badly mistaken. Instead, James Otis Jr. delivered a blistering speech that lasted nearly two hours. We often think of Patrick Henry as the greatest orator maybe in American history. For all we know, if Otis hadn't passed away so young, maybe we would be thinking of James Otis Jr. in that same light or even possibly better. Now, Otis was not very respectful of the establishment. He was upset. And Bernard described the speech. He says it was one of the most, it was, it was of the most violent and virulent nature. And that Otis, quote, abused all persons in authority, both here and at home. Otis, Mike writes, didn't go so far as to attack the king himself, but Bernard said that he traduced his government with all the bitterness of words. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that uh, you can actually read about that speech. I've got some highlights here from J.L. Bell on this one right here. And J.L. actually makes an interesting point that the circular letter in and of itself wasn't really aggressive. It, Dickinson, in my view, his letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania were far more strongly worded than what was passed. There was, like I said, the letters that were being sent off, there was a lot of respect and deference to the king, even to parliament in some ways. There was a lot of actual courtesy and kindness that weren't really talking about any type of aggressive resistance. But the fact that they were even doing this was so hated in the British government and by the people who supported it. And this is what J.L. Bell has to say. He said, once Hillsborough demanded that the Massachusetts House rescind the letter, however, he moved the argument beyond what would be considered a fair system of taxation in a worldwide empire. So it wasn't just a discussion about what's the right amount of taxation or taxes in general. Instead, he turned the conflict into one over whether the crown could compel some of its North American subjects into abjuring their established speech and principles. In other words, you don't even get to say you oppose this. We are demanding that you retract this. And this created a whole new level of resistance and opposition. And what was the result? Back to Mike Meharry he says, the colonists had the right idea. When government officials abuse their power, they deserve derision and not respect. And by the way, Mike writes, the Massachusetts House never did retract that circular letter. The governor responded by dissolving the assembly. So what was the response? I think it was in April of 1768. They're like, the assembly's done. You're not going to do, if you're not going to obey us, if you're not going to do what we tell you to do, you're out of work right now. So they dissolved the assembly, which led to riots in Boston and ultimately the American Revolution. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was fun to watch or listen to. 
I hope it was educational. More important than anything, I hope you learned something. I will include a bunch of links in the show notes so you can read and learn more. In fact, I will include a link from JL Bell's blog, which is just, you can, it's a reverse chronological order of a series of like four to six blog posts going in detail through this history that you can read through if you want to learn more and get all kinds of reference links. Of course, if you support what we're doing, you like the show, you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform. It really helps tell the algorithm of the platform to show the program to more people. So do sharing links to things like YouTube and Facebook or any of the mainstream platforms, comments in the archive, subscriptions, notifications, all that stuff. It tells, let's trigger that algorithm. It's easily triggered. And I really appreciate your help spreading the word. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, like I said, right at the outset, you can do so for as little as two bucks a month. And you can find that membership program over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.